Today on From His Heart, we're in Pastor Jeff Shreve's new series called Future Shock. What in the world is going on? These are timely and eye-opening messages to help us prepare for the soon second coming of Jesus. Join us today as we study clear biblical prophecy that declares who and who will not be taken into heaven before the earthly chaos begins. Find out how you can know for sure that you will be raptured. If you have your Bible, please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We want to talk today in our series, Future Shock, we want to talk about one of the biggest, most grandiose shocks that's going to hit this world and could hit this world, according to the Bible, at any moment, and that shock is the rapture of the church. It is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rapture of the church. It is a doctrine that is taught in the word of God. But lots of questions concerning that. And people who love the Lord and love his word can disagree when it comes to the subject of the second coming of Christ. Now, the second coming of Christ is a key doctrine in the Bible. It's talked about in the Old Testament. It's talked about in the New Testament. If you put the Old Testament and the New Testament together and just look for the the references to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you find one in 25 verses speak of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, it's spoken of 321 times, one in every 30 verses. It's the second most popular doctrine in all of the New Testament, second only to salvation. All Bible writers in the New Testament, the nine who wrote in the New Testament by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speak of the second coming of Christ. In the book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, it's taught on every single page, on every chapter. It's a very, very important doctrine, but lots of us have questions about it, questions concerning the second coming of Christ. Well, the Thessalonians had questions too, and they were asking Paul, they were concerned about their loved ones, and they were thinking with their loved ones who had died, I guess they're gonna miss this thing called the rapture of the church. So that is what Paul is referencing when he writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll begin reading in verse 13. He says this, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. We don't want you to be unaware. We don't want you to be ignorant about these things, about those who are asleep. Asleep is the Bible word for people who have died in the Lord. We don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now, we grieve when one of our loved ones who's a Christian dies, but we don't grieve as the unbelieving world does because they have no hope of the afterlife. So we don't grieve as those who have no hope. For if we believed, verse 14, that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The Thessalonians had questions concerning the coming of the Lord. You and I have questions concerning the coming of the Lord. So today we wanna look at four key questions regarding this passage, regarding this uh, discussion of the coming of the Lord that we know as the rapture. Question number one, 
very basic question, what is the rapture? What is the rapture? Well, look at it again in verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself, he doesn't send uh, an entourage of angels. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. The only archangel that is mentioned in the Bible specifically is Michael. He'll descend uh, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Trumpets were used in the Bible to signify a meeting with God, used in the Old Testament that way. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. What is the rapture? The rapture is the secret coming of the Lord in the air. Now, I say it's the secret coming. When the Bible talks about the second coming of Christ, I believe, as do many other Bible scholars believe, that speaks of two events. There's the secret coming and the second coming. There is the rapture and there is the return of Christ. When the Lord comes in the air and we're gathered up to him in the air, that's the secret coming. That's the coming in the clouds. When the Bible talks about in the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah, when the Lord returns at the second coming, he plants his feet on the Mount of Olives. He comes at the battle of Armageddon in John or Revelation chapter 19. Very clear, he comes to the earth. The, the difference being at the rapture, he comes for his own, and at the return, he comes with his own. They say, it says in Revelation 19, that when the Lord comes back, he's riding a white horse and he has armies with him riding white horses who have been washed clean. That speaks of his own, his bride. So the rapture is the secret coming of the Lord and in the air is important. Secondly, the rapture is the catching away of the bride of Christ. Now, some people have said this concerning the rapture. They say, well, you know what? The word rapture isn't even in the Bible. Some of you guys, you make a whole doctrine out of something that's not even mentioned in the Bible. You do a, a search on any kind of Bible program and try and come up with the word rapture, you're not gonna find it. That's true. The word rapture is not used in the Bible. The word that's used in the Bible is the Greek word harpazo. It's translated in verse 17, shall be caught up together. It's translated caught up. Harpazo means to snatch away. It means to uh, seize with force. It, it's kind of the picture, and the Lord even furthers this by saying he's gonna come like a thief in the night. Harpazo is the picture of a thief coming and snatching away the jewels. He doesn't do it slowly, he does it quickly. And the scripture says that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, it's gonna happen just like that. The, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, snatched away. Harpazo. Harpazo is translated in the Latin translation of the Bible that uh, Jerome spent so many years translating the Hebrew and the Greek into Latin in the late 300s uh, AD, he translated the word rapti. Rapti in Latin is harpazo in Greek. It means to steal away, to seize away, to, to take by force. We get from the word rapti in Latin the word rapture, rapture. So if you don't like the term rapture, then you can go with catching away or seizing away or, or rapti or, or harpazo, whatever you want to do. I'm going to stick with rapture because it's just easier to remember. But it is the catching away of the bride of Christ. That's what the Lord is going to do. He's going to take away his bride. And it is the blessed hope and the comfort of all believers this idea that the Lord is going to come, Paul had told the Thessalonians about this. And he said in chapter one, he was talking about their faith and he said, I'm so impressed with your faith, how you turned from idols to serve the living and true God and then you're waiting for his son to appear who will deliver us from the wrath that is to come. 
That's a, a good description of uh, what, a, what the Christian life is like. You turn away from your sin, your idols, whatever they were, and you turn to the Lord, you repent and believe on Jesus, and then you begin serving the living and true God. And while you're serving God, always in the forefront of your mind is the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming again for me. And it is a comfort. Because Paul said in verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. Hey, are you down and discouraged? You think about the fact that the Lord is coming again. And he's coming for me. It's a word of comfort. Titus uses the term blessed hope. We're to be looking for the blessed hope. And he says the glorious, uh, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. Hey, incidentally, if anybody ever tells you that Jesus Christ is not God and the Bible doesn't ever declare him God, go to Titus chapter two, verse 13. The glory of our great God and Savior. Who's our great God and Savior? Jesus Christ. That's our great God and Savior. But here's the point. The, the idea of the rapture, what is it? It's the Lord coming in the clouds to call us in a moment in the twinkling of an eye to snatch away his church, his bride to himself. In... John chapter 13, Jesus told his disciples some bad news. He said, guys, said the last supper. He said, guys, I'm going away. They said, you're going away? What do you mean you're going away? I'm going away. It's to your advantage that I go away. They're like, no way is it to our advantage that you go away. Jesus, we want you to stay here. No, I'm gonna go away. And then in chapter 14, because they were so forlorn, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If I were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, those were words of comfort that he gave to his disciples. And it's a picture in that passage in John 14, one through three, it's a picture of the Jewish wedding ceremony. In the Jewish wedding ceremony, oftentimes the marriages were arranged and there was a betrothal, an engagement, different from our engagements because you couldn't break those without a formal divorce. And so uh, a man would be betrothed to a wife, to a woman, and they were going to get married at some date they didn't know when it was going to be. The, the husband-to-be would go off and prepare a place for his bride. He would be working on a room, maybe uh, next to the father's house. He's adding a room for them to live. And the father of the, of the groom-to-be, he would be overlooking that, and he would be inspecting that. And when that was right, he would say to the groom-to-be, everything is ready, now go get your bride. And the bride's job was to get herself ready because she didn't know when her husband-to-be was going to come. So she had to live in a state of readiness and ex uh, excitement and expectation and uh, just everything. At any moment, he could come. Uh, you know, he, and he might come in the middle of the night. I gotta be ready. I gotta have my bags packed. It's kind of like if you're getting ready to have a baby, you have everything to, to get ready. So in case her water breaks, you're, you're ready to go. You're not having to put everything together. Oh, wait, wait, don't I, wait a minute. I gotta pack. I gotta do this. I gotta do that. No, you have your bags ready. And so that is the picture that the father says to the son, go get your bride. And he goes to get her unannounced and he just comes. I'm here. Are you ready? I'm going to take you to the place that I prepared for us. Do you remember when Jesus said, of that day and of that hour, no one knows, not the angels, not even the Son, but the Father alone? That is keeping with the Jewish wedding ceremony and the Jewish tradition. It was the Father who would say to the Son, now it's time, go get your bride. And that's what the rapture is. It is the son coming himself. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. He goes and he gets his bride. So what is the rapture? It's the secret coming of the Lord in the air, the catching away of the bride of Christ, the blessed hope and the comfort of all believers. Second question, when is the rapture? When is the rapture? Now, when is not going to be a date because the Bible makes it clear we're not supposed to set dates. We don't know when. 
And if anybody who tries to tell you when, there are people that have written books. I think it was 1988, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. It was a hot seller until 1989 hit. And then, then not very many people bought the 88 Reasons. He came out, I'm told, with another book, 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1989. After that, he came out with another book, 90 Reasons Why I Was Wrong, uh, for 1990. You know, I had one a year. I'm just making that up. But 88 and 89, that was true. And so we're not supposed to do that because the Lord says, you don't know when I'm coming. But we can have an idea, and we are told to be ready. And listen, when he comes, the Bible makes this clear. When he comes, he'll come like a thief in the night. When he comes, he will come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. And he comes, and there is no time when he comes to get ready. You have to be ready. Because he comes just like that, quicker than that. The twinkling of the eye is the fastest movement of the human body. He's not talking about a blink. As fast as a blink is, it's faster than a blink. It's the time that it takes for light to hit the eye, the twinkling of an eye. That's how fast he comes. He comes and he's gone. That's why in the clip uh, left behind, we saw those people were just gone, gone, left behind. Their, their clothes are just there. They're, they're just translated out of those clothes. And you could be sitting and talking to a person who is, is raptured before your eyes, and you, you, would, you would say, what happened? Well, this person was just here. Now they're just gone, gone, because that's how quickly it happens. You must be ready. But in general, when is this going to take place? Well, there are schools of thought regarding the second coming of Jesus. I want to put some of these on a screen for you to help you. Now, I want you to know up front, I make no bones about the fact that I believe what I believe, and we're going to talk about that, but other people believe other things. Other people smarter than me don't see it the same way as I do when it comes to eschatology, the study of end times, but that's okay. Uh, This is America. They have a right to be wrong. Here we go. Uh, This is the position called the historic premillennial view. It is, there's the cross of Christ. Jesus died on the cross. There's an indefinite period of time called the church age. And then there is a break, which begins the tribulation period, which is seven years long. And then Jesus returns. And what we just read about the rapture of the church and the return of Christ, that's all like one event. We go up. He could, we meet him in the clouds, and then we come down with him. So it's kind of go up, go down. Then that starts the thousand-year reign of Christ, and then you have the new heavens and the new earth. That's a historic pre- premillennial view. Millennial, don't let that confuse you. That just means 1,000. So the pre-1,000-year reign of Christ view. Then you have the amillennial view. Anytime you see ah in front of a word in the Greek language, it means not. So amillennial means there's not a millennial. So they just see the amillennialist, and normally a liberal is going to be amillennial because he likes to explain away the word of God. So he just sees that there's a church age after uh, Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead. There's a church age, and then Jesus will one day return, and then there's heaven. So there is no thousand-year reign of Christ. Let me tell you something about that. Revelation chapter 20. In the first seven verses, it mentions six times the time period, 1,000 years. The devil is going to be bound for 1,000 years. The devil is not going to be able to deceive the nations for 1,000 years. Uh, Christians are going to rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years. At the end of the 1,000 years, the Lord is going to release the devil. You have six references to the time period, 1,000 years. So I reject the amillennial view because the Bible clearly mentions a thousand years. You have this view called the postmillennial view. That says this, there is Christ, died on the cross, rose again from the dead. Then you have the church age, it started at Pentecost, and the church is ever expanding. And then you have this time that's the golden age, and the church is reigning, and things are just getting better and better and better. And what ushers in that? Not the return of Christ, just the world turning to Jesus. Do you see that happening? I sure don't. And then you have the return of Christ, and then you have heaven. So this time period in here in the post-millennial view is that's the millennial kingdom, and it comes before Jesus. He comes after the thousand years. And then you have this last view, the modern premillennial view, 
This is the one that I would cling to and hold to. You have Christ dying on the cross, rising again from the dead. You have the church age, and then you have the return of Christ at the rapture. You have the tribulation period that lasts for seven years. Then you have the bodily return of Christ to the earth, the battle of Armageddon, and the millennial kingdom for 1,000 years. So those are the different viewpoints. Now I want you to see in the second chart, here is a timeline, the way I understand end times. You have where we are right now, the present church age. You have at some undisclosed time, we don't know when, perhaps today, the rapture of the church, the catching away of the bride of Christ. When the church is caught away, then you have this thing called the tribulation period, seven years of tribulation. The first three and a half years, the beginning of sorrows, the last three and a half years called the great tribulation. It's a horrible time. In the middle point, the midpoint, that's when the devil declares, the Antichrist declares himself to be God and says, you're not gonna worship any God but me, and if you don't worship me, I'm going to kill you. It's called the desecration of the temple. And then you have the Lord come back at the return of Christ, the millennial reign, final judgment in Revelation chapter 20, and the eternal state of heaven. So let's look. Hopefully you're not confused. Let's look at the different views that people see concerning the rapture. You know, you had all this millennial stuff, premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, your brain is fried, and then you have uh, pre-tribulation premillennial and post-tribulation premillennial, mid-tribulation. All that means is when is the rapture gonna take place? Do you think the rapture comes before the tribulation? Do you think it comes at the midpoint of the tribulation? or do you think it comes at the end of the tribulation? I believe it comes before the tribulation, and I wanna to explain to you why. It's because the rapture occurs before the wrath of God comes. Very clear. The rapture comes before the wrath of God comes. You say, where do you get that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse nine. It says, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. We're to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. There is wrath coming on this world, and the Lord delivers us from the wrath to come. You have to remember something. The book of the Revelation given to John on the island of Patmos in about 95 AD. He, ta he talks to John, the Lord reveals himself to John, and he tells him, he gives him the seven letters to the seven churches. He tells him the things that are and the things that are going to come. He gives, them, he gives John a, a glimpse into the future, a major glimpse into the future. He shows him all these things. Now, if you'll notice, as you read Revelation, the church is mentioned in Revelation chapter one, Revelation chapter two, and Revelation chapter three. The church is mentioned 17 times in those three chapters. Then you hit Revelation chapter four, verse one, and John says, and I heard a voice of someone speaking to me with the sound of a trumpet, and he said, come up here. And he was caught up into the heaven. And then he starts to see things in heaven. And then in Revelation chapter 6, we are introduced to judgment. And it comes in the form of first seals. The Lord Jesus is handed a scroll, and the scroll is sealed with wax. And every time he has to pop a seal and open up the scroll a little more, and then it's sealed with wax again, and so he has to pop another seal to open it. And every time he opens a seal, he reads of judgment coming. And you go through all these seals, and they're terrible. They're, they're war, and they're famine, and they're terror, and the coming of the Antichrist, that's the first seal. And so all these things, and then you hit the seventh seal, and you think, oh, we must be done. The seventh seal, he pops it open, and it's seven trumpets, and it's seven trumpets of judgment. And everything, it keeps getting worse and worse, and the seventh trumpet of judgment is seven bowls of judgment. And from Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 18, all you read about is the wrath of God being poured out on this world. 
And the people understand in Revelation chapter six what's going on because they say when the sixth seal is broken and there is an earthquake and the mountains move out of their places and the people cry out and they go into the mountains and they hide out in the caves and they say these words, fall on us and hide us from the presence of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the day of the wrath of their, uh, of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? Revelation chapter six, those people know this is wrath coming from God. And the scripture says when the seventh bowl is poured out upon the earth, it is done that the wrath of God is now completed. Well, the Lord comes to save us from the wrath that is to come. He hasn't destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Well, what kind of a husband beats up his bride before he takes her to, uh, to the wedding? I mean, that would be a crazy kind of deal. No, the Lord takes out his bride before the wrath comes because it's clear that it comes, the rapture occurs before the wrath of God comes. And secondly, the rapture occurs before the revealing of the Antichrist comes. You say, well, where do you get that from? Second Thessalonians chapter two talks about this, the gathering together. See, the Thessalonians, they were, man, they were really in tune to this thing called the harpazo, this gathering up. And Paul says, I'm giving you this by the word of the Lord. You know, uh, one Bible commentator said in the Old Testament, they didn't have any concept of this thing called the rapture. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, behold, I tell you a mystery. It's something that hasn't been disclosed before. But I'm telling you this now because the Lord has revealed this now. I tell you, he says in verse 6, 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. And what is going to happen? Here is the timeline for the rapture. There is going to be a falling away from the truth that is going to take place before the Lord returns. He says that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The gathering together will not take place until there is first an apostasy, a falling away. We're living in the days, I believe, of apostasy, of Christians falling away from the truth, of churches that used to believe the word of God, and now they just they have little sermonettes for Christianettes, and uh, there's no preaching of the word of God, there's no believing of the word of God, there's no discussion of sin, and so if there's no discussion of sin, then there's no need to, there, there's no conviction of sin, and there's no need to repent and so people just come to church and they just get encouraged and, and uh, you know, hey, just keep on going, buddy. You're doing great and God loves you and he wants to fulfill your dreams. And, you know, the Lord is just some uh, heavenly bellhop. He's just there uh, ready to snap too. You know, you snap your fingers and he runs and he's like a little genie in a bottle. You know, you just rub the, the bottle and he comes out and he says, yes, master. That isn't God. God doesn't do that. He is God. He doesn't work for us. We serve him, it's not vice versa. And so we get, we get that confused. Listen, God loves us and he wants to do good by us, but, but he doesn't come to our beck and call. We serve him, he doesn't serve us. But you, you have a whole generation now of, of churches that are just preaching that and coming at it that way and there's a falling away. And Paul says there's a falling, when there's a falling away, that is going to trigger the rapture. And then after the rapture, you know what happens? Then there is a revealing of Antichrist. The scripture goes on to say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that there is a restraining force in the world today that is restraining the revealing of Antichrist. I believe when he talks about that, he's talking about Christians. He's talking about the Holy Spirit in the Christians. But what happens at the rapture? The Lord calls out those who are possessors of the Holy Spirit. He descends from heaven with a shout. It's a shout of command. I think it's the same kind of command he gave Peter when Peter wanted to walk on the water. And he said, Lord, if, it, if it's really you, bid me come to thee on the water. And he said, come. What did he say to dead Lazarus four days in the tomb? Lazarus, come forth. It was a shout of command. He's going to issue a shout of command that says, come. And his bride will hear it and they'll hear the trumpet and they'll come and they'll come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Boom, just that fast. 
And after that takes place, there is a man who's going to assume power. He is known as the Antichrist. And when the rapture hits, as I told you last week, Daniel had a prophecy of 70 weeks. And the last week of Daniel's prophecy, I believe, has been on hold because we're in this period of time known as the church age. But then when the rapture hits, the church age is over, and then the time clock begins again. And there's going to be a covenant between the Antichrist and Israel, and he's going to let them rebuild the temple, and things are gonna be going good, and they're going to think the Antichrist is their Messiah. That's how twisted they will be. Jesus said, I come in my Father's name, and you don't receive me. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive, and they're going to do that. But as you saw in that that one graph, at the middle point, the Antichrist is gonna reveal his true colors, and the Jews are going to understand we've been deceived, this isn't our Christ. This is the Antichrist, and then they're gonna turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. But listen, how do I know that the rapture, why do I believe the rapture occurs before the revealing of the Antichrist? Because we're told to wait for God's son, the Lord Jesus, who will be revealed for heaven. I'm not looking for the Antichrist, I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And if Jesus weren't going to come until the Antichrist was always here, already here, we'd be looking to see who's the Antichrist, who is it? Is it Barack Obama? Is it Henry Kissinger? Is it Larry Sims? Nobody believes it's Larry Sims. <laughs> But we just, we start trying to figure it out. Don't try and figure out who the Antichrist is. Let me tell you something. If you figure out who the Antichrist is, you miss the rapture. Because you're not gonna know that until after the restrainer has been removed. So when is the rapture? It comes before the tribulation period. Question number three, what happens at the rapture? What exactly happens here? That's a good question. As we've said, the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ himself descends from heaven with a shout. He leaves his throne. You know, when he uh, rose again from the dead, he was with the disciples for 40 days, and then he ascended into heaven, Acts chapter one, uh, out of their sight, and the angel said, why stand you gazing up into the sky? This same Jesus whom you saw ascend to heaven will come in like manner just as he said. He's going to leave his throne. He's going to come back to this earth in the clouds, in the clouds to get his bride because the father has said, Jesus, it's time. Go and get your bride. Today's your wedding day. And he comes back and there's a shout of command and there's the archangel that is there and he blows the trumpet and he gathers and it says the dead in Christ shall rise first. So what happens at the rapture? The dead in Christ are raised. Some have wondered what what happens to a Christian when he dies, when she dies. That's what these Thessalonians were wondering. What what happened to my loved one? Where are they? You know, there are some people that teach that you you are in a state of soul sleep when you die. Where do you go? Do you go to be with the Lord? No, 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 you don't go to be with the Lord. You just go, you're just in a state of sleep, a state of slumber. You're in soul sleep. Bull. The Bible doesn't teach soul sleep. The thing that's sleeping is the body. Absent from the body, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, is to be present with the Lord. When your loved one who knows Christ dies that fast, they're with the Lord. Their body is put in the ground or is cremated or whatever. It can fall overboard and be eaten by fish. Their body is somewhere, but the real them, their spirit, their soul, that, that part of them is with the Lord. The real them is with the Lord. It says in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. The Lord has those dear saints with him, but they're gonna come back at the rapture and they're going to be reunited with their bodies because the dead in Christ shall rise first. And the spirit and the soul, the body is going to come up out of the tomb and the spirit and the soul is going to be put back together and the Lord is going to glorify that person and they're going to be glorified forever and ever and ever. And I love this. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that uh, he says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the dead in Christ shall rise and we shall be raised incorruptible. 
And then will come about this saying, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Those people who trusted Christ, who come up out of the tomb, they can laugh at death and mock at death and say, oh, death, you couldn't hold me. Oh, grave, you couldn't hold me. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is in the future. So the dead in Christ are raised. Secondly, Christians are given a glorified body. This is such good news that we get a new body. I, I, I hope you're excited about it. My body is falling apart. So I'm excited about a new body. It says in Philippians chapter three, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, not for the antichrist to appear, we wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Well, when does that happen? It happens at the rapture. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The Bible says that this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. If we're going to experience God in the glory, we have to have a new body to do that, and he's gonna make our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. And that is good news, that we get a new body. Now, this is for Christians, mind you. This is for true Christians. This is not for pretenders. This is not for professors. This is for possessors of the Holy Spirit of God. This is for the genuine and the true. All those who claim to know Christ and there is no fruit and there's never been any change in their life and they're just living a lie, those people are left behind. The Lord calls those who are really his. And then it says that Christians will be with the Lord forever, forever. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We're gonna be with him forever, and it comes at that moment when the bride is called up and we're transformed, and then we're with the Lord forever and ever and ever. Now, the question can be, well, Jeff, didn't Jesus say in Matthew chapter 28 when he gave the Great Commission, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age? I mean, how is this any different? The Lord has been with us. The moment we receive Christ as Savior and Lord, he's with us. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. That's true. He is with us. But at the rapture, He's no longer with us. We're with him. I told you some years ago about an experience I had when I went to Venezuela on a mission trip. I was leading a mission trip, and we had about 16 people going. And so we were flying from Houston to Venezuela, from Venezuela back home to Houston. And one of the guys on my trip was a guy who was a world traveler, and he had tons of frequent flyer miles. And so when we were getting on the plane in Houston, he got me, he got himself bumped up to first class, and he got me bumped up to first class. I've never flown first class before or since. First class is wonderful. I mean, it, it is just the greatest thing to be in first class. I, I'd never been there before. I'm just sitting down. It's just like, man, this is a better seat. I got a lot of leg room. And they gave you little booties. It's like, take off your shoes, put on these little booties, and, and just here's a blanket. And, and what do you want? They gave you a menu, a menu. And uh, then after I ate, the meal was great. I mean, they just can't give, do enough for you. And then they came by with a hot fudge sundae. That was awesome, first class. When we flew from Venezuela to Houston, John couldn't get the first class going. He got it for himself. He couldn't get it for me. And being the nice guy he was, he said, Jeff, I'm gonna sit back in coach with you. Coach is a whole different experience. I'm sitting in coach. I'm getting crammed. The guy in front of me is leaning back. I just don't have any leg room at all. My knees are hurting. Uh, so I stretched it out. And then when the beverage cart came by, it hit me in the leg. Uh, then, I, then when they did come, no menu. It was just like, this is what we got. 
I hope you like it. And I asked the, the guy, I said, uh, he was the, the flight attendant, I said, hey, I said, if you have any extra meals, I said, I, I, I'm over here, you know, I'm, I got a big appetite. He looked at me, you know what he said? He goes, what's the matter with you? You got a tapeworm? <laughs> well, I had just been to a third world country. I was thinking, I hope, hope not. I, I don't, don't want a tapeworm. Gosh, that'd be terrible. And then I thought about it. I was like, how rude. This guy, does he not know who I am? I'm from first class. I, I just got stuck back here. And Here's the difference. The Lord is with us right now, and all of us live in coach. But on that day, we're going to first class to be with him. So the last question. What do you do if you miss the rapture? What if you're here today and you're hearing all about this wonderful, blessed hope, this, these words of comfort that the Lord is coming back for his church? What do you do if you miss it? Well, if you miss the rapture, you can mark it down. You will experience the tribulation. You'll, ex you'll go through the great tribulation. The great tribulation, the tribulation period is seven years. The last three and a half years is called the great tribulation. The tribulation period is God pouring out his wrath on the world. During those seven years of time, billions with a B, billions of people die. Billions. It is the most horrific, the most horrible. That's why just in the early on, the sixth seal where terror comes and there's this giant earthquake and all the mountains are moved, that the people go hide in the caves and in the rocks and they cry out to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of the lamb and from him who sits on the throne for the day of the wrath of their great wrath is coming. Who is able to stand? It's a terrifying experience. It says in Revelation chapter nine that the Lord uh, opens up, he sends an angel and he opens up the, the abyss, which is like the prison of the most vile, wicked uh, demons who ever existed. The Lord, they were so vile that the Lord locked them in the abyss. Well, they open that up and they come out and they're like locusts and they have a sting like a scorpion and it says it stings men who don't have the mark of God on their forehead. They haven't been singled out by the Lord and the, the, the pain is so intense that men long for death and death flees from them. They will gnaw their tongues in pain. It is a horrific time during the tribulation. And if you miss the rapture, there's no turning back. You will go through the tribulation. I had a man tell me one time, he said to me, I couldn't believe this, but he, he said it with a straight face. He said, I don't want to be caught up in the rapture. I want to be in the tribulation so I can face off with the Antichrist. I said, really? You want to do that? He said, yeah. I mean, he's kind of like, I'm going to bow up at the Antichrist. I'm going to give him what for. He's never met me. I said in the nicest way I could, sir, you're an idiot. <laughs> I, what an idiot. Nobody, that's like saying, you know, I can handle that tornado. I know it's coming 160 miles an hour, but it's not met somebody as strong as me. You will get mowed down. Jesus said concerning the tribulation in Matthew chapter 24, and unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days shall be cut short. Can you imagine everyone on the earth dying inside of seven years? What must the situation, the, the circumstances be like for every single person to die if the Lord doesn't cut that short? It's horrific. You miss the rapture, you will go through the tribulation. And if you miss the rapture, listen to me, you may miss heaven forever. Lots of people think, well, if I miss the rapture, Jeff, then I'll know, maybe you're here and you're thinking that, well, I'll know if the rapture hits like it did on the Left Behind movie and I'm on an airplane and praise God, both my uh, pilots are lost and I'm not, that thing's not gonna crash. And so, but I'll know, I see all these suits of clothes and people just gone and, and uh, you know, millions and millions and millions of people just gone like that. I'll know that the Bible is true, that the, the scripture is true and I'll 
put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Oh, you think you will, huh? Hey, listen, the Bible talks about during the tribulation period, there are untold millions of people that get saved, many of them Jews. You have 144,000 Apostle Pauls that go out uh, in, from all the 12 tribes of Israel that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they preach the Lord Jesus Christ. Lots of people are getting saved. Uh, lots of Jews are getting saved during the tribulation period. But I don't believe that there will be lots of people getting saved during the tribulation who are folks like you, who have been in churches and heard the gospel time and time and time again, and you've blown it off and blown it off and blown it off and blown it off. I don't think that those folks are gonna be saved during the tribulation. Here's why. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, if God doesn't draw you, you can't get saved. If the Holy Spirit of God doesn't pull on your heart and show you that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him, you can't get saved because you can't get saved anytime you jolly well please. It has to be a work of God. And this is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, talking about the restrainer being removed that holds back the revealing of Antichrist. And it says, and then that lawless one will be revealed. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Why do they perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. They wouldn't receive the love that Jesus shared when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence. This isn't the devil deceiving now. This is God sending a deceiving, a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Here's what the Lord says. You hear the gospel and you hear about the love of God that was shed abroad when Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead, how he offers you the free gift of salvation. You hear that, and you say, hmm, well, I could give my life to Jesus, but then that's gonna change my ability to conduct myself in my sin and have my sin and, and enjoy my sin, and so you make a decision in your mind. I'd rather have my sin than God's son. You take pleasure in wickedness. You do not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And once you make that decision, then God says, all right, that's your decision. And you take a step in the wrong direction and then the Lord gives you a shove in that direction. And you will not believe the truth. You will believe what is false. And I think that is going to be true for millions of people who have sat in Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches all over the place because they said no to the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, there is no more call. There is no more pull. There is no more knock. So what is the message of the rapture? The message of the rapture is you can't get ready. You have to be ready. And now is the time for you to be ready. I'll close with this story. In a particular city years ago, there was a nightclub called the Gates of Hell. And a man was visiting in this city, and he wanted, he had an evening free, and he wanted to, to have fun at a nightclub. And so he had remembered that they, there was this nightclub where, boy, there was just lots of fun there, and it was called the Gates of Hell, but he didn't know how to get there. He knew he was close, his hotel was close, but he didn't know how to get there. So he's walking in this city, he sees a policeman and he says to the policeman, he says, can you help me find the gates of hell? And the policeman thought for a moment, and he said, yeah, I know where that is. And he told the man this. He said, yes, I know where that is. It was right past a church. And so he said this to the man. He said, go down this street and go right past Calvary, and you'll find the gates of hell. Maybe you're here today, and I'm telling you, you're one heartbeat away from an eternity without Christ if you don't know him. 
And listen, if you go past Calvary, you will find the gates of hell. But the good news is you don't have to go past Calvary. You can stop at Calvary and you can bow your heart and you can bow your life and you can say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And just as we sang this morning, Jesus saves and he'll save anybody who will cry out to him in repentance of faith. Would that be you today? That be you today? The Bible clearly tells us what the world's going to be like when the Lord returns. And you know, that world that the Bible describes, it's upon us right now. So here's the big question. Are you ready for the return of Christ? I mean, if he came back right now, are you ready? So many people are not ready. They're not 100% sure. But you can get sure today. You can pray this simple prayer with me and mean it from your heart and the Lord will come in and change your life forever. Just say with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I believe that you love me. So I ask you to come into my life Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me. Make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in, and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know what's going on in your life, to know how we can pray for you, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth.